the hair in the back of my neck stood up. There was this strange guy with her. When I looked into his eyes, I could see something evil in him. Boston was experiencing a very high murder rate at the time. It wasn't safe. She was number 33 out of 153 murders that year. This is the case used here in Massachusetts that says you are within your rights to take their DNA from them. This is going to be a cutting edge case. That sounds to me like one of the very first cold case units. Inside these prison walls was your best opportunity to try to break this case. This is the most extensive negative confession I've ever received in all my years in homicide. What you had here was somebody is caught dead in a lie. Plus the DNA, you stir it all up, you get justice. But instead you got something else. My name is Anasiga Nicolazzi. In my two decades as a New York City homicide prosecutor, I saw how murder affects lives far beyond the crime scene. Let me take you inside the fight for justice for victims and their loved ones. This is True Conviction. This historic neighborhood of Boston takes me back to my years as a prosecutor in Brooklyn. Today, Mission Hill is a safe haven for young professionals. But in the early 90s, it was a hotbed of crime. And this is the very building where a 19-year-old working mother named Sandra Francis was brutally murdered. Sandra's death could have been chalked up to just another casualty of a dangerous city, a story I know all too well. Instead, homicide investigators spent six years refusing to let the case go unsolved. And now, 30 years later, I'm here to learn how determined detectives and one relentless prosecutor teamed up to catch a killer and find justice for Sandra. In 1984, Sandra's family immigrated from Antigua without much more than a few dimes and big dreams. Renice, you and Sandra were first cousins, but you actually were much more than that to one another. Yes, we were raised like sisters. She was my sister, she was my friend. We lived in the same house, slept in the same bed. How would you describe your relationship? It was great. I don't recall one time us ever fighting. She was a very kind person. She was beautiful. She was someone I looked up to. I met Sandra in high school, and we immediately became friends. After getting to know her, how would you describe Sandra? Loving, um, a go-getter, like she had goals. She had a really sweet heart that I worried about. You know, I saw her in some ways as vulnerable because she was so sweet and caring. Quiet and determined, Sandra stayed focused on her studies. But in high school, she met a boy. And when she was 18, she had a boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And in that year, Sandra got a big surprise. She sure did. And I, I was the first person in the family that she told. What did she tell you? She just said that she's pregnant. Months later, Sandra gave birth to a baby boy. But soon after, she and her boyfriend, Vaughn, broke up. A senior year, Sandra had a baby. And that was a big shock to the family. So this was not part of her plan? Not at all, because culturally these things were not appropriate and didn't happen. So she got up and on her feet and got herself an apartment. Now she'd been living with a roommate. Emma, yes. How long before Sandra's death did Emma move out? Maybe a week. Tell me about Vaughn. Sandra dreamed about getting back together with this, her baby's father. She really wasn't interested in anything else. She had such a drive for success, but she did fantasize about one day, you know, them getting back together. She had the idea of like them being a family. Did that cause pressure or friction between them? There was. There was a lot of friction between the two of them. Things around child support and time. 
How did Sandra handle all this? She was a mother, she worked, she went to school, and she was still in her late teens. It didn't phase her. Not one time did I hear her complaining about how things are or what isn't working. She just did what had to be done. And even with the change in life plans, she still forged ahead and went to college. She did. She sure did. What do you remember about Sandra with her son? She definitely loved her son very, very much. She really made sure that he was taken care of. If she had to work or go to school, she would drop him off at our house. She always came back at the time that she said she would. But on March 22nd, 1990, things didn't go according to plan. I remember that day that she dropped her son off at her family's house so they can watch him because she had to go to work early in the morning and needed childcare. Later that night, we talked on the phone and I told her that I was gonna call her back. Something that haunts me to this day is that I never called her back that night. But you expected to be able to talk to her the next day. Well, I did not get to talk to her the next day. Why not? Something terrible happened that night. Not only had she not picked him up, but she hadn't called. It was so strange. You get this feeling inside like something isn't right. After two days without a word from Sandra, the family took action. James Barry was the assigned patrolman to the Mission Hill neighborhood in 1990. On March 25th, Sandra's concerned family flagged him down. Well, Sunday patrol parked across the street Sunday morning. I had somebody knock on the window with a cruiser, and it was Sandra's uncle, and wanted me to go in and check out the property. How did you get in there? The uncle had keys, so I used the uh, keys that he gave me and made entry into the hallway and found her apartment door and uh, opened the drawer and stuck my head in and, and saw her dead with a knife protruding through her chest. When you walked in that doorway, if you go back in your mind, lay out the scene as it appeared to you. There was a TV, and it was on, actually. She was uh, nude from the waist down and cold to the touch, so she had been dead for a while. And the, the steak knife, it was something from the kitchen that was plunged into her chest. And uh, she had been sexually assaulted. What was it that you felt walking in there and finding her the way that she was. Could have been my daughter. There was no sign of forced entry and nothing appeared to be missing, but the killer had taken the most precious thing in the apartment, Sandra Francis's life. Figuring out how the killer got into her apartment was one of the first steps for police. And where is her apartment once you get into the building? Uh, it's Right on the first floor. These windows are her windows. First door on the left. So if it's evening, if it's dark, anyone could be out here watching. Because if that light goes on, someone can see whether there's someone home or not. Absolutely. What did that scene say to you? She knew her killer. The front door to get into that building, when you went in, was it locked or unlocked? Locked. The door to her apartment, when you went in there, locked or unlocked? Locked. The windows that face this street, open, shut? Closed. So Sandra had to have let her killer in. Yes. So whether someone came in for robbery, whether they came in specifically to target Sandra, whether it's some sort of a relationship gone bad, that this was an, the horrific result, or whether there's some serial rapist killer on the loose, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, wide open. Boston PD had yet another homicide on their hands, an issue that became a major focus for Assistant District Attorney Mark Lee, a fellow former Brooklyn prosecutor. Sandra Francis was far from the first murder that year. Yes, uh, she was number uh, 33 out of what would uh, turn out to be 153 murders that year. It's uh, almost four times the number of homicide cases that we have now. 
What stands out to you about her? She was 19 years old. There's a photograph that made an imprint on my mind only because there's a serenity to it that's inappropriate almost. And that is the picture of her lying on her back in her apartment in the one place where you would think you would be safe with a steak knife sticking directly out of the middle of her chest and then yet feet from her, her son's play toys. 19-year-old Sandra Francis was a mother, a daughter, and a young woman with a future. And now she was gone. Sandra's funeral. Mm. What comes to mind when you think back to that? It was packed. It was jam-packed. And everybody was a mess. Your best friend, the girl who had been raised like your sister was yeah. gone. Yeah. What was that time like for you? It's, it's hard to find the words. It was so painful, so hard, so horrible, that it became just one horrible day after the other. I had nightmares. I just, I just was not coping well because we had made plans for me to meet her at her house at 7 p.m. And when she called me, um, I told her I was sick and that I couldn't, I couldn't make it. So with the pain, there was also guilt. Because in, in my head, I, I was supposed to be there at, by, at 7 p.m. You know, you shouldn't feel that guilt. There is no guilt. Only the person who caused that is responsible. I've told myself this for decades now, but it still doesn't change how I feel. While Sandra's family grieved, investigators were already on the hunt for her killer. As it turns out, they didn't have to look very far for their prime suspect. A lot of times the police think, you know, significant other or a jilted lover. Sandra had a son. She no longer was with her child's father. Right, so of course, one of the first people they would have wanted to talk to was the father of her child. Could the bad blood between Sandra and her ex have led to her murder? Or was there a more sinister plot investigators had yet to uncover? In March of 1990, 19-year-old single mother Sandra Francis was brutally raped and murdered in her apartment. We did know the person who did this had to have had some kind of contact with Sandra in order to get into the home because there was no forced entry. So that was a piece uh, of the puzzle. Of all women murdered, two out of every five are killed by their significant others. Boston PD decided to play the numbers. At the top of their suspect list, her ex-boyfriend and father of her 18-month-old son. Your interaction with Vaughn, how well did you know him? Not that well. I knew him through Sandra, but like he was also very well known and popular in high school. Do you remember the first time you saw him after Sandra was murdered? The police were interviewing everybody and I saw him walking down the hallway and his eyes were bloodshot red and the look on his face of devastation. And I shared that with him. And not for one minute did I think that he could do this to her. Fortunately, there was some forensic evidence collected with Sandra Francis. Yes. Because of the nature of the crime scene, it was natural to do what's known as a rape kit. Police had been looking very closely at her ex-boyfriend. They were able to compare what was found with Sandra Francis to his DNA. What yes. was the result? The result was that he was excluded. Police considered who else could have gained entrance to Sandra's apartment, someone she recognized, someone she trusted. They interviewed Sandra's co-workers, friends, and even her roommate's boyfriend. But one by one, each suspect was eliminated by DNA. We know from over the years that if a case isn't solved in those early days, that there's a better chance that it may never happen. Right, which is always, always a danger when you're in a big city. If it's 153 murders, 365 days, having a murder almost every two days. So the homicide unit is trying to make uh, do with the resources that they have. These things are 
they're marathons, they're not sprints. And uh, sometimes justice comes quickly, sometimes justice takes a long time. After several months with no leads, Sandra's case was in danger of going cold. Sandra's family feared that her death would be just another number in Boston's rising body count. And because the justice system was foreign to this immigrant family, they didn't know how to work with investigators. In Antigua, unlike here in the States, the police and the law and the way things work is completely different. We didn't have any idea how to navigate this process. It was just this helpless sadness, really, and not, not a clear path on where to go. And months turned into years, yep. no answers. Yep. Yep. I reached a point where I just figured that it wouldn't be solved. As prosecutors, we are sworn to fight for justice, not only for the victims, but for all the people whose lives have been touched by murder. In the Sandra Francis case, that meant justice for an 18-month-old baby robbed of his mother and for friends and family who couldn't move on without knowing the truth. But the road to justice can be long, and sometimes it takes time for all the right pieces to fall into place. That time came six years later when one of the nation's first cold case units picked up the case. Seasoned investigator, Lieutenant Detective Stephen Murphy was paired with Captain Tim Murray, a tenacious young investigator who just happened to become a Grand Master Chess Champion. Together, they would embrace bold, unconventional strategies to solve some of Boston's biggest cases. By 1996, one of the cases that you looked back at was of a young woman by the name of Sandra Francis. Sandra Francis was a beautiful 19-year-old college student, total innocent victim, terrorized minutes before her death. Obviously, this case cried out to be solved. My partner and I approach cases from complementary angles. Steve is the master at crime scenes. My job was to profile the victim. I want to look at it from both angles. You don't have the luxury of walking through that crime scene. However, I think sometimes people think, oh, you're looking at pictures. But these pictures, they really speak to us about what it is, the story that you can tell. What facts became apparent to you and your partner when you looked at these? Since we didn't know what time of death uh, or anything to go on, whether or not this was a stranger robbery, a, a lot of cops theorized that it could have been an, an intimate friend of hers, a uh, dating relationship. One night stand, but Steve said that the clothes that she's wearing, the khaki pants and the white shirt, uh, turned out to be the uniform of the day for the place where she worked. And Steve also analyzed the crime scene and said, she's watching the Home Shopping Network. So if you're having a first date or a dating relationship and you're inviting a fella in, you're not watching the Home Shopping Network. She's not killed as soon as she gets home. Like, she doesn't put the key in the lock and some stranger jump up from behind because she has time to take her coat off, go inside, take her makeup off, put the home shopping network on. And then sometime after that, there must have been a knock at the door and she answers it and the person must have talked his way in and once inside attacked her. So we're talking about a, sort of a, a con artist that gets in. In the business, we call that a power assertive rapist. Power assertive rapist. I've never heard that term. Explain to me what that means. A power assertive rapist would be someone that feels it's his God-given right to be able to dominate women. Outwardly, he's not trying to establish his masculinity. He thinks that he can just use women for sex and his M.O. oftentimes is to cruise around looking for unsuspecting victims, prey upon them, and then leave. But investigators had not found anyone among Sandra's acquaintances that fit that M.O. Not yet, at least. Now, in our line of work, we get to know our victims through their tragic deaths. What did you learn about Sandra, the person that she was before she was killed? I believe that everybody has three lives. Public life, private life, secret life. So I wanted to find the dear diary type girlfriend, the kiss and tell girlfriend, the person that Sandra told all their hopes, dreams, aspirations, and private life to. And to do that, I started to call all her friends that were in the file. And as I did it, 
the candidate pool of who might be the Dear Diary girlfriend shrank and shrank and shrank until it was down to one. One girlfriend that knew everything, Emma. High school classmates and ex-roommates, Emma and Sandra, were like kindred spirits. If anyone knew Sandra's secrets, it was Emma. And based on talking to Emma about anyone that might have came into uh, Sandra's world, she told me about this guy came home with the victim one day. And in talking to Emma, along with everything else that you learned about Sandra, Emma gave you a name. Yes. What was that name? All Emma learned was that the guy's first name was Lee. Hi, Emma. It's Anna Siga, Nicolazzi. How are you? I'm good. And how are you? Good. So I had a long talk with Detective Murray, and one of the names that you told him about was a person named Lee. Yes, I remember. When is the first time that you remember seeing or hearing about him? Late January or the beginning of February when I was babysitting her son. We needed groceries. So Sandra went grocery shopping. So when she came back, there was, you know, this strange guy with her. And I was like, who's this? Who's this, Sandra? She's like, this is Lee. He just helped me with the groceries. The hair in the back of my neck, like, stood up. Because when I looked into his eyes, I could see something evil in him. Cold case detectives had a new lead in the unsolved murder of Sandra Francis. According to Sandra's friend Emma, a man named Lee helped Sandra with her groceries just a month before the murder, then continued to show up at her apartment unannounced. Emma told us one night there's a knock at the door around midnight. Sandra opens the door and talks to the man. No, Lee, you can't be here. What, what are you coming by for? The more I talk to Emma, I circle back to Lee. She'd say, there was one other time in my mother's house over in Jamaica Plain, and I got a call late at night, 9.30, 10 o'clock at night, and it's Sandra, and she's whispering on the phone. Emma, he's here. He's here. Who? Lee. He came and he won't leave. Emma going to the rescue of her best girlfriend, who gets up with her nightgown, eight and a half months pregnant, gets on the trolley and goes all the way down to Sandra's. And Lee's still there. Says, hey, time to go, Buster. And kicks him out. And then later on, she recalled a fourth visit. And I'm like, oh, man, this is our guy. So now what we want to do is we want to find him. But easier said than done. All you know is that it's a guy named Lee sure. from Boston in 1990. Yes. And six years later, we're trying to do this. How did you go about finding Lee? So going back to the file, there was a reference that Sandra had asked her friend Roxanne to check out a guy named Lee who lived in the same side of town that Roxanne did. Who was Lee? Lee was really aggressively seeking her. I remember her telling me that he kept asking her to come to his house. Was she interested in him? Not at all. She was like, can you just find out something about him, anything, so I can use it as an excuse? So why not just ignore him? Why did she need an excuse? It's part of who Sandra was. Like, she didn't want to hurt people's feelings. She was so sweet that to protect herself, like, she needed help protecting herself. Usually, a no means no, I don't want to go out with you, but she needed a no because. Almost like a no wouldn't be enough for him. She needed to have a backup answer, like he wouldn't just accept no. Investigators didn't have a last name, but they did know that Lee lived somewhere on Hazleton Street in Mattapan. Finding him would require some old-fashioned police work. Steve and I went back in residential listings and paper records, going to the library where family lives on Hazleton Street, try to put last names to Lee. And while doing this, we found it was a Perkins family at 132 Hazleton Street. We put Lee with Perkins, Lee Perkins, went to a criminal records, voila. It's a promising lead, 
not only had Lee Perkins been inside Sanders' apartment, he had a criminal record, and he had once even been arrested for rape. They also discovered that he'd lied to Sandra. He was actually married, and the house on Hazelton Street belonged to his mother. Perkins was quickly emerging as a prime suspect in Sandra's murder, and this time, detectives knew right where to find him. Lee Perkins was already in jail after being picked up on previous assault charges. We're driving out to the Mass Correctional Institution where we met Lee Perkins on May 31st, 1996. Here it is, six years after Sandra Francis is murdered. Her case was cold for years. You and your partner have opened this back up and not only begun the reinvestigation, but you've narrowed it down to this one single person as your, potentially at least, your prime suspect, the person you believe killed her. And this is your one shot to see if this takes you over the line. We knew this day was going to be an epiphany one way or the other, and we wanted to give it our best shot. So you rehearse it a lot with your partner. You go over all the if and thens. If he does this, then what are we going to do? If he does that, what are we going to do? Just like in a chess game, you know, you can prepare what you think your opponent might do when you finally sit down with him. But if he does something in the first couple of moves you didn't expect, you still have to adapt. So there's a lot riding on this because it's not like you're going to get another shot. Absolutely. It had taken nearly six years, but detectives finally believed they were on the verge of solving Sandra Francis's murder. Securing a conviction, however, would require an inspired bit of police work. That would change investigative procedure forever. In 1996, detectives zeroed in on a suspect in the 1990 murder of Sandra Francis. The supposed Good Samaritan who had carried Sandra's groceries to her apartment less than a month before her murder. Now it was time to confront Lee Perkins face to face. So it's inside these four walls, Tim, that you were about to get your best shot at trying to break this case. One way or the other, we felt this was the biggest milestone day in our pursuit for justice for Sandra. So tell me how it went. First thing, uh, we sat down. He asked us what we wanted to talk to him about. So I said, Sandra Francis. He said, I don't know Sandra Francis. So as soon as he starts saying he doesn't know her, doesn't know anything about her, looking at pictures of her, I never seen this girl before in my life. I wasn't in Boston then, worse to that effect. We know that the best we can hope for today is what Steve and I refer to as a negative confession. We want to lock him into as many denials as possible and later on impeach these. You know, young assistants often say to me, oh, if the person didn't confess, I'm not going to use the statement. But they are sometimes better yes. than the one that's a straightforward, I did it and here's my excuse. Detectives knew they could prove that Perkins was lying. And in court, that can be as good as, and sometimes even better, than a confession. So at one point after he's made these repeated denials, on the table, there's a couple of sodas and a freshly washed ashtray. Which was purposeful, I bet. Purposeful. Why? Purposeful. Explain it. Because we're hoping for a voluntary blood sample, but if we don't, we're going to have our eyes open for any abandoned DNA. And I think see, people don't always understand that, too. There's two ways to get DNA. One is the known sample, which is when you get the search warrant, you take it from someone's mouth or sure. some other way, or abandon, which is when they leave an item of property behind. In this case, I take out my cigarettes, put them on the table, and then I start patting myself down like I'm looking for my lighter. And he looks at the cigarettes to the table. He goes, can I get one of your smokes? Feel free, help yourself. This was the turning point in the case. Mr. Perkins drank a soda and smoked two cigarettes and left the empty can and the two cigarette butts in an ashtray in the room. The detectives collected both of those butts and the empty can and had those swapped for DNA. That's commonplace. We get DNA from abandoned samples all the time now. Yes. That was not the case back then. No, not at all. And in fact, I don't recall ever having heard that being done until it was done in this case. Once you got that DNA sample and it was analyzed, what was the result? 
Finally, when the analysis comes back late summer 1996, they say Lee Perkins cannot be excluded. Now that I know he cannot be excluded, we want to bring Emma back in and show her a photographic array. And we put 10 pictures on the table. She went through face by face, going through, and then she said, this guy, that's Lee. Now you know you have your person. Absolutely. Lee Perkins was indicted and charged with first degree murder, but this case was far from over. You know, one of the things that I've thought about in this case is Lee Perkins had repeatedly asked her to go to his house. Keep in mind that his house is the only place that Emma is not going to be. And we believed his M.O. is what we call the spider in the fly. We believed he wanted to lure his victim, this case Sandra, to his residence. That way there, after a sexual attack, it's less likely that the girl will come forward because He'll say, hey, she came to my house. She was, quote unquote, asking for it. Or if she does come forward, that she won't be believed. Wait a second. So you're saying your rapist got you to come to his house with his mother upstairs and he raped you instead of it being consensual sex? 100%. Too often in my career, I've seen victims of sexual assault blamed for the crimes of their attacker. By inviting Sandra home with him, detectives believe Perkins was planning to use the same defense. But his plan didn't work giving prosecutors the opening they needed to secure a conviction. This is the most extensive negative confession I've ever received from a, from a suspect in all my years in homicide. And that, plus Emma, plus the DNA, skillful prosecutor, you stir it all up, you get justice. With Perkins under arrest and a trial date set, Sandra's family could finally breathe a sigh of relief. Justice for Sandra was within reach. Lee Perkins went to trial. Correct. What happened in that trial? You know yourself as a former prosecutor, the odds of a rape and murder were taking the witness stand really, really, really small. Defense counsel really tries not to get their, their guy to take the stand, but he did. And told the ladies and gentlemen, the jury back in 1990, uh, you know, I was married, I, I'd go cheat on my wife, et cetera, et cetera. He's trying to say, I had sex with her. someone else came in afterwards. In the so 90s. basically they're saying the killer was someone afterwards. He has consensual sex with her, but then someone else must have come in and killed her. Correct. In addition to the DNA evidence, the prosecution also relied on the testimony of Sandra's friends. What was your involvement with the process after that? Well, I was asked to testify. It was a really tough experience to relive all of that because I was a witness. I was not allowed to be in the room at all the time. I was in the hallway and waiting many days. After testifying and waiting all those days during the trial came the day that you were expecting a verdict. Yes. But instead you got something else. I don't understand what happened, but it was a hung jury. The jury came back 11 to 1, a crushing blow for the prosecution. The DA's office speculated that one juror had strong opinions about the criminal justice system, and despite all the evidence, believed Perkins was wrongfully accused. All I could think of, a lot of times in the legal system, there are black males who get mistreated and abused, and that was the word that they didn't have enough proof. Like, they felt that, you know, this was another case of someone being accused of something they didn't do. How did that impact you? I, I couldn't believe it, because I felt so open and used. Like, I gave so much. It's such an emotional experience to go through that I wanted closure. I, I needed closure. The family needed closure. Sandra deserved closure. The DA's office now needed to try this case again, this time with a new prosecutor. For Mark Lee, it was a daunting challenge. It's never easy to take over someone else's case, to earn back a family's faith, and hope that this time the trial will end in justice with the killer behind bars. The long-awaited trial of Lee Perkins for the murder of Sandra Francis ended in a hung jury. But in early 2000, the district attorney was determined to try the case again. And this time, the assignment would fall to former Brooklyn prosecutor, Mark Lee. 
Mark, this was the first murder trial that you handled after coming to Boston from the Brooklyn DA's office. And as we know, things run a certain way in Brooklyn, but now you're in a whole new city, and I can only imagine that the pressure is on. Yeah, especially Boston. Uh, you know, no one knew who I was, and uh, I didn't really have a lot of contacts here, and I wanted to uh, prove that I belonged where I was. There's always a lot at stake in every murder case, but you were walking into a case that had already been tried once before, and not by you. The only time that I had that, I found it very difficult to just learn on paper initially and have all this voluminous testimony that I myself had not been involved in. Tell me what that was like for you. It is difficult. You have to really dig into the case and figure out what the case really means, what it's all about. It's just that there was a loan holdout. It was an 11 to 1 case to convict. Uh, so I knew I didn't have to do a lot differently, but I wasn't just going to roll the case out and try it exactly the same way it had been tried the first time. Now, there was a difference in the actual evidence between the first trial and now when you actually tried it the second time. Yes, he had initially made a statement to the police in which he denied knowing who she was. When he was confronted with the presence of DNA, he then uh, changed his version of events and said that it was a consensual sexual activity. And then he posited that somebody else must have come in and, and killed her. When Lee Perkins took the stand in his first trial, there's the, uh-huh, maybe we have to go and dig a little deeper to see if we can show that what he's saying is not true. Right. There was a pair of uh, uh, Ms. Francis's underwear that had not been examined uh, in the first trial. We asked that, that it be examined, and what we found that was that her underwear had no evidence of any semen, sperm, or DNA from a foreign body. If a woman has sex and then she goes about her daily business afterwards, she dresses herself she gets up, one would expect to see a deposit in the underwear of semen or sperm. Because of the absence of that, but the presence of it in her vagina, the sexual act and the murder had to have taken place at the same time. The, the true killer uh, would have practically had to high-five Mr. Perkins on the way out the door. They would have had to really run across each other if, if his story was correct. Which really sounds ridiculous on its Lud face. Ludicrous. Sandra's friends. Talk to me about what you remember about these young women. They stuck through it thick and thin. They were trying to honor her memory. Emma being very close with Sandra. She testified not once, but at the second trial too. What was the significance of her testimony? Emma gave us a lot of good background on Mr. Perkins's behavior towards Sandra in the days, weeks leading up to the case. He started inserting himself into her life the guy was knocking on her door at unpredictable times, then inappropriate times. Her testimony provided some kind of motive or explanation for why he would be somebody who would do this. Once you gave your summation, the judge instructed the jury this time there was indeed a verdict. Yes. What was the verdict? It was the verdict that we all thought was the just verdict and the correct verdict. First degree murder. What was he sentenced to? Life without the possibility of parole. On January 20th, 2000, Lee Perkins was convicted of first-degree murder and aggravated rape. He was sentenced to life in prison for the murder charge and 30 to 40 years for the rape. Hearing the verdict in this case, mm -hmm. what did that do for you? Satisfaction, right? Satisfaction, now that they've got him and he's put away and he's, and he's paying for it. Mark Lee, he's one of my heroes. What makes you say that? I feel like he really fought. Like he saw Sandra as a person. He was so strong and aggressive towards like, this is not fair, this is not right. And trying to get justice for the family, for Sandra, for her son. When you think about this case, what stands out about it to you today? What it really stands for is perseverance. Um, I would trot this case out to a family who was on the verge of giving up hope about their love, their, their loved one, and say, it's never, ever over. If we don't think about why we're doing it and what this means to so many people, the loss, I don't know that we really can give it our all. It's a very different kind of pressure than the kinds of pressure that other lawyers face in, in a different setting. It's the pressure of having the mother 
of somebody who's been lost, their daughter, their son, and just the simple question, do you think we're going to win this case? That's unspeakable pressure. So uh, the connection that you make with the families of these folks is, is um, really indescribable. And you and I could sit here for the next six months talking about it and never really adequately explain to somebody else. But I don't think I need to spend more than three seconds talking to you about it to see that you understand. It's the eyes. I always think it is something indescribable that you yeah. see in their eyes, which says everything and means everything yep. to me. Yep. Mm hmm We don't need to say any more on that um, because that's it. Yeah. And what we are tasked with trying yeah. to at least give them what we can yeah. in the criminal justice system. Yeah. It's about all we can give. In a city that was once flooded with crime, in a year that hit the high watermark of homicide, Sanders' case did not fall by the wayside. It was finally solved thanks to those who stayed with her in life and also in death. How do you want Sandra to be remembered? She was very, very kind. She was a great mother and also a great friend. She always saw the good in everybody. I gave my daughter and Sandra's whole name, Sandra Alicia, is the middle name, so I could always remember her. If you shut your eyes for a second and picture her, tell me what you see. I see me, her, and her son in that little apartment, listening to music and just dancing and laughing and having a good time. Now, you wrote in your yearbook. Yeah. About Sandra. I did. And I've read it. It's beautiful. Would you read some of it for me? Sure. Sandra will be greatly missed, and I realize that all the good words won't take away the pain. I thank God for her. She realized she could achieve great things just by believing in herself. Sandra, my life has been touched by your presence. Thank you for sharing your life with us. I haven't read that in years. Yeah. 